Um, I'm trying to remember precisely what my topic says in our uh, in our flyer, but it's something like uh, new generation of sanctions, market-oriented solutions, and there'll be a smattering of all that. Uh, but really, it's about talking to the issue of what I call the economic and financial threat domain. And uh, when you think about hybrid warfare, unconventional warfare, which we've talked about a lot in the past few days, you think of its actual components from a sort of percentage breakdown point of view. And the military is actually not that big in terms of actual military action. Let's throw out a, a number like 20% when you're actually moving troops and deploying. Uh, you have disinformation, a significant piece, cyber attacks, adulterating elections, active measures. Uh, I've never really seen a breakdown of how folks assign percentages to what hybrid warfare is, but for what it's worth, that's my best take. But there's a big, uh, a big gap there that I think constitutes as much as 40 to 50 percent of the action. And I'm talking about now specifically Russia and China's brand of hybrid warfare. And I think it's made up of what we call the economic and financial war, war fighting domain. Because at the end of the day, uh, that's what's underway. And uh, it's an everyday thing. Uh, both countries have been pursuing it for decades. They have a plan. And you can see it uh, quite clearly when you actually focus on it the way we do. Uh, we have a, uh, a software tool called Intel Track that we developed about six, seven years ago that tracks and visually maps every transaction of Russia and China globally on a daily basis. And so we have six years of data of everything they've been doing, both financial and in terms of standard business transactions. And the idea is to see what constitutes sort of benign commercial, what we might think of as legitimate trade deals, and finance deals for that matter, and uh, something that's security related, strategic, and not truly related to market terms and conditions. Yeah, please. This is all open source. And, and so this is publicly available information. And probably 90% of what they do in that domain is, by definition, has to be uh, in plain sight, because that's for sure where they've moved their most strategic operations. And lots of people look at illicit activities, you know, money, I mean, everything from money laundering <coughs> to organized crime to drug cartels to terrorism financing. In fact, the military has a term for it called counter threat finance. And you have to have sources and methods, that's for sure. Uh, and the whole thing is, as I say, classified and you're going looking at bank accounts and uh, it's very forensic. This, on the other hand, this domain is what we consider the international trading and financial system. It's legal, it's legit, and they use it heavily because it's frankly unmonitored. When you do things in plain sight, it's assumed to be commercial and legal. And they have realized that nobody really is paying much attention at all to this differentiation between commercial and strategic. And so when you see uh, their activities in various countries, certainly Russia and the region here, uh, you see this phenomena that we affectionately call nation capture, which is a you know slow, steady, incremental effort to purchase critical infrastructure, to go into every privatization auction they can find and buy up strategic assets. Uh, they bid on nuclear power plants, they bid on uh, electric power. Uh, obviously, the energy sector is rife with this in the case of Russia. They still naturally want to control the pipelines and the natural gas deliveries. 
and they don't want to lose market share. In fact, they're gaining market share, as you might know, which Nord Stream 2, for example, is only going to intensify. Despite the efforts of uh, the EU's third energy package, which is being systematically ignored uh, to, the, to the surprise of some folks in southern Europe that were forced to give up the South Stream pipeline because it was obviously uh, seen as a, a, a violation of the third energy package, and yet when it comes to Germany, uh, they, uh, they obviously paid no attention to this concern and uh, diversifying away from Russian gas specifically, and now they're in the business of helping Gazprom you know, re-dominate, if you will, the region. So it's got to be pretty disheartening, and it has caused divisions in Europe properly, and it is becoming a growing subject in the United States. So it may be that Nord Stream's going to happen, but there's going to be more blood on the floor before it does. And it's not just going to be courageous companies like Denmark that's trying to stop uh, the transit routes, for example. I mean, they're holding their fingers in the dike, but clearly the system's wired against them. So Nord Stream is an example uh, at a broader level of what you might think of as regional capture. Uh, but when you get down to nation capture and these strategic infrastructure projects, you needn't look any further than, say, the Pax uh, nuclear deal in Hungary, where you have a sweetheart deal cut between Putin and Orban in a back room, no tender, no public attention to terms and conditions. In fact, they passed a law making the actual terms and conditions of the deal secret for 30 years. Gee, I wonder why they did that. You know, it's rife with corruption. It's a $13 billion deal for a country of, what, 11 million people? And, uh, and so you would have thought that they would have at least had some legitimate tender. But no, it was a sweetheart deal. And, uh, and the EU at first opposed it strongly and then systematically caved in. I don't know how else you'd put it. If you can find a more generous explanation, I'm listening. But this is what we do for a living, and there's not lots of generous interpretations. So, but the kicker here is, of course, the, the Russians are professional at this. They make sure that uh, even though they're giving 100% financing, which incidentally is non-market, no Western company provides 100% subsidized financing for a deal of that size. You can forget that. And, but they, they make sure that they take over the whole plant as collateral if there's any kind of default. And then they control 100% of the fuel supply, uh, again through Rosatom, so that in effect you can write off 50 years of Hungary's nuclear sector. So the whole thing went away in one deal. Now, does that capture a nation? No, probably not. Is it three times the largest deal on Hungarian history? Yes. Uh, it's a pretty efficient way for Moscow to keep its mitts on Orban and Hungary, and it's no coincidence that Hungary is the sticking point in the upcoming NATO summit. And so it should be clear that economic and financial war fighting is a very efficient way to go. And the Czech Republic is going to experience basically the same thing in the same sector with Temelin and Dukovany, which is coming up probably next year at $10 billion, again for 11 million people. The largest single deal that I know of that the Czech Republic ever did was the Gripen Fighters at $5 billion. So double that. And you know, with Zeman in power, that this thing, and at least I would just guess, Bobby should be different, if not pro. You've got a deal that's wired for Rossitom right now, all things being equal. They will walk away with that deal. The other player that could become a kind of surprise player in this thing is China General Nuclear. And I wouldn't be surprised if before it's over, the Chinese and the Russians actually get together on this and form some kind of joint venture. It's not impossible. So, but you definitely want to watch 
that drama. You've got the South Koreans, you've got the French, you've got other Western alternatives. And how you would not go with those alternatives is pretty shocking at this stage. Uh, so, but these are just, this is just one sector. If you take another deal in this country that affects the region that's emblematic of what I'm talking about is uh, something called Central European Media Enterprises, CME. Uh, it basically had majority ownership of Time Warner. And Time Warner in the U.S. Uh, is bailing from that investment because it's, uh, they, need to, they need to reduce their debt structure for the merger with AT&T. So they put it up on the block and uh, their voting rights are, I don't know, 75 percent? So there's only one kicker. Who's the only bidder uh, for CME when it controls Nova Television in the Czech Republic, which some would argue is the largest television station in the country? But it has six major equivalents uh, total. Five other NATO countries are implicated. Uh, I think it's Croatia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Romania, and I think Slovakia. So you have six countries and their major media outlets, and who's bidding on the deal but China's CEFC, which is, uh, can be translated into People's Liberation Army, and, uh, and Penta Investments of Slovakia, which, generously speaking, is awfully friendly to Moscow, and uh, over a beer, you know, in a back room somewhere, it might be called a Russian front by those that are less generous. So these two entities are getting together to buy up the media assets of CME. Well, luckily, CEFC got in trouble because their chairman got a little too highfalutin and he insulted Xi, and she had him, in effect, arrested. And so Cidic, uh which is another vast you know, Chinese conglomerate, stepped in to CEFC Europe to take over the deal, and there's been a delay, but they're still the only bidder. And I'm convinced that when things settle down at CEFC, uh, they're going to give it another go. <coughs> and they're going to try to do this deal. Well, you know, it's very hard for our country, I mean, certainly the U.S., to reach over and stop that deal because our, our authority from the so-called Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States that's designed to interrupt deals like this for security-related concerns doesn't have the authority to reach over and stop an American company overseas selling its assets to anybody it wants. Is that a gap in our screening structure? Definitely. But, you know, Moscow and Beijing are all too happy, you know, to run through that hole. So here, that's another example uh, of what, what we're talking about. And the efficiency, again, you can't, you got to marvel at the fact that they do one deal and they pick up six major media outlets in as many small and some would say vulnerable NATO member states. So that's in short, I mean we can we can talk in the Q&A section about as many examples as you want because I could sit here and rattle off these these kind of examples all morning. Uh, but that this is the outline of what I'm talking about when we discuss the polite term for the topic today, which is the economic and financial threat domain. The war fighting idea, you know, rubs people the wrong way and has people recoil a little bit, and so we tend to not use it. But uh, make no mistake that this is economic and financial warfare uh, by another name. So uh, it's, it's in short what's in plain sight that you need to worry about, and the fact that Russia and China have learned to play this thing to a fairly well. I mean, they just are, turn in a virtuoso performance because 
They're looking at every deal and how it fits in their matrix. We're reacting ad hoc, deal by deal. We have no strategy. We have no plan to, because we assume if it's transparent and in the open economic and financial domain, hey, what's wrong? You know, we're not equipped to look at this. And we don't have the authorities in place to look at it. And big surprise, when Moscow and Beijing figured this out about three decades ago, they moved all of their strategic activity into plain sight. So we're the only firm I know, and PSSI, of course, shares this data, uh, that has an open source database that's looking at this <coughs> granular a level and trying to actually work it every day as to which deals fit in to this web, this matrix, this stranglehold, if you will, and which do not. So that's why we have an economic and financial threat program. We're the only think tank that I know of that does. And fortunately, we're equipped with a rather unique capability to be able to prosecute that case. So if you think that's sort of a, a quick snapshot of what we're doing now that we can come back to uh, uh, later in the discussion, because obviously that's the most germane to you, is what's happening now. But this is not, again, new in the sense that in the Soviet period, they broke the code on this too. And uh, we weren't really equipped then either to deal with this. I mean, we had then and now very different transatlantic perceptions of the then Soviet Union and the now Russian threat. I mean, us politique is alive and well, witness Nord Stream 2. Uh, in those days, the Germans felt that there were 19 million hostages on the other side of the wall to protect. So it was an elaborate payola scheme, just like you'd have in <coughs> racketeering. They wanted to placate the bear and feed him with resources and money uh, and high technology at some level <coughs> in order, and not to mention the exports of jobs that go with it for them, uh, to have this kind of accommodationist kumbaya moment with the Soviets. And they can, were convinced that this was clearly in their national interest, and lots of Europeans agree with that then and now. So not much has changed there. And the Reagan administration, which I was part of in the year, at the beginning of the 80s, had a very different view. They saw this, I mean, at the time, they saw this uh, two-strand Siberian gas pipeline coming down, coming down the pike of which, by the way, Nord Stream 2 is an iteration of, and that's something I'll explain later. But, but uh, there was a plan uh, in 80, 81, really starting in 79, that, but, but it reached its crescendo in 81 when Soviet troops were massing on the Polish border, uh, threatening invasion in order to stop solidarity and the Catholic Church from undermining, you know, communist rule. Uh, at the very moment of that danger, they come up with a the largest project in East-West economic history, the Siberian Gas Pipeline deal. 3,600 mile, two-strand pipeline, Uruguay gas fields into the West European gas grid that when fully subscribed, would have raised West European dependency on Soviet gas to over 75%. Today, we're in trouble from a leveraging point of view at 32 to 35%. So just imagine if it was more than double what kind of problems we have now. I mean, if you think that NATO's being torn apart at the seams on something like Nord Stream 2 now, just imagine if this had gone uncontested. Uh, so, uh, and Russia's hard currency earnings 
annually would have just about doubled. I mean, if you can believe it, in 1982, when I came into office, at the very beginning of 82, um, the Soviets were making 32 billion a year in hard currency, which was at the time about one third of the annual revenues of General Motors or Exxon at the time. So one third of one American company made as much as the Soviet Union in hard currency terms to run an empire that at the time stretched from Havana to Hanoi. Not a lot of dough. Now most of those costs are ruble costs and arms shipments and you know all kinds of other forms of, of barter and the like. See, it's not like, you know, hard currency was the only thing in town. In fact, it was a smaller portion of the overall package, but obviously pretty critical. If you don't have a convertible currency, come on. I mean, how do you buy stuff from the West? It's, it's just that simple. So <clears throat> they were making 80% of their income on just four export items, oil, gas, arms, and gold. 66% of that income then and now was oil and gas. You might ask what's changed. Well, you know, not a lot. And uh, and they were making, they were spending 16 billion more roughly a year than they were making. And they were financing 100% of that gap from Western governments and banks. And to add insult to injury, we figured out that the cost of the Soviet outside external empire was about 16, 15, 16 billion a year. So the West was financing 100% of the hard currency costs of the Soviet empire worldwide. Now, let that sink in for a minute. That's not an opinion. We can have different opinions on missile defense and all kinds of things. This is an empirical fact. Okay, these are estimates, but close enough. So, uh, so there was a decision to be made, and Reagan's decision was that we're not going to permit U.S. oil and gas equipment and technology to be used for the Siberian gas pipeline because of the threat to Poland and the fact that the Soviet Union was in a particularly aggressive mode and a dangerous mode back in 82, that's for sure. I mean, people talk about, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis as the peak of the Cold War. I would argue that the early 80s would easily give that a go. They did, and Dropoff was in charge. <coughs> the guy was very clever, insidious, <coughs> aggressive, and unfortunately knew very much what he was doing. So <coughs> it wasn't, it wasn't a, a, happy, a happy event. And very fateful decisions were being made. So <clears throat> the reason that we had something really going for us on oil and gas equipment and technology is because we had developed the North Slope of Alaska. We had the only technology in the world that could drill through permafrost. We had the best turbines in the world that couldn't be replaced. We had a lot of stuff at the time that was a global monopoly. So all, basically all the European companies that were selling to the Soviets were selling under U.S. license. So we felt we had leverage, and we were prepared to use that leverage. And we also made the discovery that of this $32 billion pipeline, which would be more like you know, $3 billion today, uh, you had the financing coming from, again, Western taxpayers, but on non-market terms, on actually subsidized terms because the Soviet Union had cleverly classified itself as a developing country, a less developed country, so that it would be eligible for subsidized below market credits, interest rates. So that's what they were getting. And uh, that was of course outrageous because it has Western taxpayers paying for the privilege of <coughs> having the Soviets dominate their West European gas markets for the rest of time and all of the leverage attendant to that and double their hard currency income so that they could expand their predations worldwide. <clears throat> Pretty clever. 
So, uh, so when we contested that uh, pipeline and we demanded the accelerated development of the troll gas field in Norway as an alternative to Soviet gas, you'd have to make a political decision on Norway because it was more money. And the reason it's more money is because the Soviets could underprice anybody because they have no real cost. They're administered costs. They just make up a number. And it's automatically 10, 15% less than the competition. That's the way they paid the game. They didn't care about the money. I mean, they cared about the domination. And that's the problem today, right, with China and Russia, is when they're playing the strategic card, they don't give a damn about return on investment and profit. They don't even care about getting the loan back so long as they've taken the underlying critical assets, strategic assets as collateral. What do they care? In fact, I know f for a fact that they lend huge amounts of money to countries that have no chance of repaying because they want what they really want is the fine print and to take over you know, the high-speed rail or to take over the port. That's a big one and the power stations and everything else that keeps the country a going concern, so it's beholden to them, big surprise. So, um, so in this story, uh, we were going after the credits, we were going after uh, stopping the pipeline, we knew we couldn't stop the first strand, we thought we could kill the second strand, and we basically tried to convince the Europeans that there should have a maximum 30% dependency on Soviet gas, and that's it. Uh, and we were, it's not like we were requesting at that stage. This got very heated and became a demand. Western Europe told us to pound sand that there's no way that they were going to do that. And so they decided to break with us despite their pledge to be in solidarity with us on the Poland related sanctions, they went ahead with the deal. They sold our equipment and our technology under our license and basically gave a gesture, an implied gesture to Ronald Reagan. Big mistake, by the way. And, uh, and so off they went. Well, we had some tough decisions to make at that stage. And the decision was that we're going to enforce, uh, we're going to extend the sanctions to licensees and subsidiaries overseas, which is a technical polite way to say that we told them that that's our oil and gas equipment and technology and you are not selling it anymore. And they said, oh yes we are, those are our companies and we're going to make that decision and you're not going to apply law extraterritorially to us something that they say now. I mean, extraterritoriality is as hot button an issue today as it was then. And so Reagan said, okay, well, <clears throat> if you want to play hardball, then let's do this. Your companies can make a choice. You can do business with the Soviet Union or you can do business with the United States, but you're not going to do both. So we closed the U.S. market and the U.S. financial system to those companies because they kept shipping. And four of the six companies, which were some of the largest in Europe, went under in six, within six months and put 250,000 unemployed into the street. And it was about then that Europe decided maybe we've got to rethink this. And we came up with, in the International Energy Agency, a 30% cap on Soviet gas deliveries to Western Europe, the end of subsidized, taxpayer subsidized credits. Um, we had tightened technology controls in COCOM, the Coordinating Committee on Export Controls. In other words, we basically implemented a vastly more prudent, security-minded East-West economic and financial policy structure. And Europe agreed to it at the summit in Williamsburg uh, in May of 1983. And that's the way, in effect, that went down. What we didn't say, because it was a it was a, a secret plan, was to lean on the Saudis to pump two million barrels a day more, and we controlled oil pro, uh, gas prices at the wellhead in the United States, which had oil go from 
oil prices go from $40, $50 a barrel to 10 knowing that for every dollar drop in the price of a barrel of oil, the Soviets lost uh, seven, 750 to a billion dollars. Now mind you, again, remember, 30, you're starting with 32. So you're at a pretty low number to begin with. So when we took, I mean, they're, and they're a petrostate, then and now. So when we crashed the price of oil, they staggered on for six or so years. And two days before the collapse of the Soviet Union, they defaulted on $96 billion in Western hard currency debt, and it was adios muchacho, Soviet Union. Now, some people believe that all of this happened because Gorbachev was a secret Democrat, and he was an enlightened guy, and, and uh, he really was secretly had an impulse for freedom for his people. I mean, that's just utter crap. Uh, and then there's the idea that the rigidities of the Soviet economy, which are real, you know, just kind of became a train wreck that was insuperable and the whole thing fell on its own as though we didn't have to do anything. That's also rubbish. They could have muddled through, believe me, they could still be here now in a heartbeat and they're trying to get back, obviously, every day. So you can see who they are, right? I mean, I don't think I need to give you a lecture on that. So anyway, uh, this was the uh, this was the reality, and we now there were other elements of what was a secret strategy of the Reagan administration for the takedown of the Soviet Union, and this is the economic and financial piece that I've described to you. By the way, there were only twelve people in the United States that were privy to see this plan. Uh, one of them as I recall, was not the Secretary of State. So, in other words, it was a very closely held plan. And it consisted of SDI, to scare the hell out of them technologically. It was the our massive military buildup, which stressed out their economy thoroughly in their vain effort to keep up. We knew that. It was going uh, the deployment of Pershings and crews. Uh, it was six minute flying time to Moscow to make it plain that we were not going to sit by and have them deploy SS-20s without a response. It was going after them in the third world from mining the harbors of Nicaragua to Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Obviously, Afghanistan didn't work out perfectly later, but at the time, <laughs> at the time, it was a pretty good idea because obviously they lost their shirt there. And we tried to find everywhere they were operating in the third world and up those transaction costs, so to speak, to make that a bloodbath for them. That was Bill Casey, director of CIA, who was a warrior of renown and understood the, the nexus between economics and national security very well. So, uh, and finally there was the war of ideas in the UN and, you know, calling the Soviet Union an evil empire and, you know, speaking truth to power and Jean Kirkpatrick was our UN ambassador and she was relentless. A little bit like Nikki Haley is a tough gal today in the most positive sense. But Jean invented that role. And it was important. The roar of ideas and ideology is not a small thing. You've got you to gotta call them out for the thugs that they are and stop this nonsensical pretending as though they're somehow, you know, counterparts of ours or belong in the G8. That's another conversation. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's a quick snapshot, if you will, of the role of economics and finance uh, in the early 80s. And surprisingly, we lost that institutional memory. We lost the capability to wage economic and financial warfare. We didn't really pick up on the fact that these guys were going to develop ever more sophisticated iterations that involve the capital markets and all kinds of things. For example, bringing it back to today, uh, Theresa May of the UK just got acutely embarrassed over the fact that within two weeks of the Novichok 
nerve agent poisoning uh, on her soil of uh, the, like, the skip halls, you know, if I've not massacred that name. Uh, okay. Right. <laughs> it's what she said. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, Russia comes to the Euro bond market in London and raises $4 billion in cash, primarily subscribed to by British banks. Cash to use at their discretion. Well, some bright light in the parliament, whose name I can't remember, who ran the Foreign Policy and Defense Committee of the parliament, but a hero, stood up and said, what, what is this? You've got to be kidding. They're being rewarded by our market access and by our banks for a WMD poisoning on our soil? Is that what we're looking at? And Teresa was sufficiently scarred by this to say that she would henceforth consider putting a ban on Russian sovereign euro bonds in the London market. Now, the reason that that's significant we'll get back to, but you never see capital market sanctions. And the reason you never see it is just that it's ironic, but that's the way it is. So we can talk a lot about the cap markets as they are affectionately called, because I work those every day. Uh, so, I think in wrapping up this piece, I would just say the following, as you're looking at your careers, you're looking at your options and next steps, this is the, this is the pitch now, you might want to think about the economic and financial nexus with national security. Because I'm here to tell you that I believe that it's going to become the sixth domain of American warfighting. You're going to have air, land, sea, space, cyber, economic, and finance. And why? Well, one reason is because the United States utterly dominates the economic and financial domain on this planet. We built it from Bretton Woods on, with the Allies, to be sure. And, but we have some unique features in the United States. Our capital markets are just about the size of the rest of the world's combined. We have 40 to 50 percent of the world's investable capital. So if you don't have access to the depth and volume of our markets, and you're China, and it's not going to work out for you. You can't go to Frankfurt or London or Hong Kong or Singapore and think you can fix the problem. No way. They need va huge volumes of money. Huge. So we haven't talked much about China, but they are obviously the premier threat to the United States, and I would argue the Allies and to freedom for the 21st century, hands down. And obviously there are far more complex adversary than the Russians especially now that their economy is the size of Spain. We can handle, I mean, it took 25 years to take down the soaps, at least of my public policy life. I mean, I worked on it that long. It was a, it was a complicated business. But now, it would be a lot light, lighter lifting, a lot lighter lifting than the Soviet Union. So, properly, our laser beam on the Chinese because of course they have one belt one road they have their checkbook diplomacy they've got the Asian investment international investment bank I mean they are going for it in a lot of different ways I mean look at the South China Sea Island building and militarization they're filling their oats and they actually believe that they're going to win when they have a paper thin cushion themselves and we can talk about how vulnerable China really is, with debt that's 300, nearly getting on 300% of GDP, 
and a real estate bubble that has to be keeping Chinese leadership up at night. That's just being fraudulently, in effect, refinanced to keep the whole show together. And you notice they can't really engage in systemic reform because if they do, growth rates will fall another couple of points. If it falls one more point, well, they're, they're already in trouble. But if it falls another point, they're in slow motion economic implosion. So, you know, a cushion is something they don't have. Luckily, I'm not sure that they quite get that. I'm hoping they don't. Because the more emboldened they feel, the more the trap can be set. So we have plans for the Chinese. Don't think we don't. But very few folks are looking at it, again, in the economic and financial portfolio, because so few people have the skill mix. You know, you're either good at global finance and you're on your way to the investment banks, or you're a national security type, but you're not feeling so secure in global finance. So there's a problem there. You know, and the two sides don't talk to each other because national security is bad for business if you're a Wall Street guy. And I was. Obviously, I went wrong somewhere. Uh, <laughs> either the dark side or the light side. I happen to think it's the light side. But, <coughs> but it is to say that the two sides don't talk to each other. That skill mix is very rare in the national security community. And that's why we've missed the boat <coughs> so thoroughly on the economic and financial threat. But when we do get our act together, and PSSI works full time to make sure that that day comes sooner than later, well, we already have the dominance, right? That's the hard part. Recognizing how to use it is a lot easier than trying to get it, right? Ask the Chinese. So we, we're packing the gear. There's no question about it. And we have a lot of sway in the markets on Chinese credit rating, borrowing costs, foreign direct investment whether or not their state-owned enterprises become radioactive because they're also involved in a lot of nefarious activities. And the list goes on. I mean, that's where China lives and dies, is in the global markets, make no mistake. And if you think they're sitting on, you know, those $3 trillion in hard currency reserves and they're fat and happy and they don't need anybody, just keep in mind that those reserves fell a cool, a cool trillion when their stock market collapsed ignominiously in 2015 in the summer, and it's, by the way, headed for another collapse, fortunately, because it is a casino in the best of times. And um, basically, we're, we're at a situation now where um, they are rather beholden to the global markets. And those reserves are in part illiquid. We found out that, for example, uh, railway projects in Africa were part of their reserves. Now, excuse me, but how do you liquefy those assets? You know what I mean? If you're in a railway deal, that's not liquid. Reserves are supposed to be cash on the table, ready for use the same day. So I'm thinking that there's uh, 500 billion or so, at least, that is illiquid. And as I say, it can fall pretty quick when they're trying to support their currency, which again they are intervening right now. And if they have to do something with their stock market, and particularly their bond market, which is very vulnerable. But again, this is a discussion for later on. So. Why don't I close out here and uh, take questions? Benito.